Chapter 28, February 20th, 1943, Bolomansky Park. Four separate times on our way out of town, we had to hurry off the bike to hide from Nazi vehicles that screamed past us, sirens blaring or with loudspeakers ordering every citizen into their homes. Every time we crouched in hiding, Esther began crying again, but I only scolded her as sharply as I'd as I'd ever spoken to her before. It felt cruel to be so harsh. It was cruel, and I understood the tears, but we couldn't allow anyone to hear us. After all we'd, done th we'd gone through, getting caught now was unacceptable. Finally, we were on the edge of town, and when I stopped in front of the snowman, Esther looked at me as if I'd gone crazy. What are you? Oh... By then, I'd kicked away the snow, revealing our two bags, still intact, if a little more frozen. I started to sling her bag over my shoulder, but then, but she said, No, I can carry it. You're hurt. My shoulder isn't. Just help me. So I did, remembering once again that Esther's burden was every bit as heavy as mine. She was the one with the injury. She was the one who'd been kept in an open yard for a full day, tortured, terrorized, and almost certainly expecting to be dead by morning. Through all of that, according to the young soldier I met, she never told them a word. At the nearest crossroad, we abandoned the bicycle near a river. I tilted it visibly against a tree near the road. Then Esther and I planted tracks against, planted tracks through the snow down the to the river, suggesting we were moving in a direction leading away from Warsaw. I hoped that if we were followed, and we surely would be, this was where we'd part ways with the soldiers. I expected her to protest getting in the water. I saw how she was shivering already, and knew how chilled she must have been after so many hours outside. I hated that I had to make her do it anyway. And she seemed to understand that, with a flat voice, nearly empty of emotion, she said, I need help with my boots and socks. I took mine off first, giving her as much time as possible before I knelt down and removed hers, tying the laces together for the boots to dangle over her shoulders. Then she followed me into the icy water. It came up past my knees, but the cold enveloped me entirely, instantly sucking the breath from my lungs. I began shivering and had taken only a few steps before my feet were too numb to feel the river rocks below. With every stumble and slip, I warned Esther to be careful, but seconds later I'd slip again, making myself wet even above the water level. I seemed to have moved into my veins, requiring more effort with each step. All I wanted was to give up this ridiculous plan and return to land. It wasn't safe. Not yet. I tried to tell Esther it'd be okay, but my teeth were chattering, and I couldn't form the words. And maybe it wouldn't be okay, because we had a lot farther to go until I was sure they'd have quit tracking us. Every time I looked at, for an exit point, I saw where we'd leave footprints in the snow or crush the first tender or crush the first tender grass blades of the new season, or drip onto rocks. We couldn't get out until I was sure we were far enough away. A few minutes later, Esther mumbled, Please, Chaya. I glanced back and her lips were almost blue. I suspected mine were the same. Whether they'd follow us this far or not, we had, we had to get out now, or we never would. I stepped onto a frozen bank and helped her from the water, where we stood on a, froze, on a fallen tree branch to let our feet dry. While they did, I pulled her towards me, holding her in the same way my mother used to hold me when I'd wake up from nightmares. Esther had spent the past day living a nightmare, no doubt. I folded one hand around her back, and with the other I brushed her hair, letting her bury her head against my shoulder. Her sniffled, drew in a sharp breath, then began sobbing. This time, I didn't stop her. Thinking of warm things, I whispered after a few minutes. 
apple tea, fresh baked bread, matzo ball soup, warm baths, she replied, calmer now, wool blankets, reading with my family in the evening in front of the fire. That wasn't what I'd meant for her to remember, and that those same memories left me feeling emptier than before. But at least she wasn't shivering as much. I took the boots from around her shoulders. Your feet should be dry. The sooner we start walking, the sooner we get our blood moving again. Walking might stave off hypothermia. It might get us another few kilometers closer to Warsaw. It wouldn't erase the last 24 hours from Esther's mind. She wouldn't look at me differently. And when I did catch her eyes, swollen and red from crying, a haunted glaze took over before she turned away and shuddered. I couldn't begin to imagine what she'd gone through back there. Or worse, I could imagine it. We walked for a couple of hours at a brisk pace to keep our blood moving. The road wound into a forested area, thick enough with trees that the moonlight became filtered with long dark shadows. As quiet as it took, as quiet as it always was at night, this place made me feel closed in. My instinct to find roots for escape was stronger than usual. Maybe for a good reason. Although the trees offered countless places to hide, the snow was deep around them. We'd never wade through it in time to dodge a passing car. Even if we did, we'd leave tracks. Walking up river won't fool them for long, Esther had clearly been sharing my thoughts. We need to get out of here as soon as possible. The partisans hide in forests like this, I said, so the Germans avoid them. They're safer. We're safer here than we were before. The first part was true. Poland was dotted with thick patches of forest areas that the locals knew well. It was a natural hiding place for partisan fighters, and I'd heard, even from members of the Polish army who continued to fight despite being abandoned by their government. The second part was based on hope more than facts. I'd heard stories of German patrols who, had, who were ambushed in the forest, so I couldn't imagine anyone relished anyone relished orders to search the woods. But Esther was right that they would look for her, and whoever helped her to escape. Soldiers would be ordered in this direction. I tried to pick up the pace, but no matter how tired and cold I was, Esther was worse. She wouldn't she hadn't stopped shivering all night and was holding her injured arm against her chest, bracing it with her good arm. The bandage that dangled from her wrist was useless, but she wouldn't stop and take the time to let me rewrap it. Want to talk about it? My voice was gentle, urging her to talk. No. I know you didn't tell me anything. Tell them anything, I continued. That must have made them angry. Angry? She snorted. Angry is where they started. Before putting me in a dark room where everyone was yelling and if I looked away, someone slapped me or hit me and to get my attention. And they were telling me what would happen if I didn't talk. But I kept reminding myself that even if I did talk, they'd still hurt me. Maybe even kill me. I really believed that, Chaya. I believed that I'd never get out of that room. She went silent for a while, long enough that I wondered if I ought to say something. But I figured if it was me, I'd need time to, wo to work through all that had happened at my own pace, so I stayed silent. Finally, she continued. After an hour, I started to think that it'd be all right if they did kill me. Maybe it'd be better. Then they did this. She nodded at her arm. It hurt so much that I screamed loud enough to scare them. Suddenly, I wasn't afraid anymore. I was the angry one, more than any of them. I said, you want me to talk, and I'll tell you this. Then I'll tell you this. The reason I ran away is because I have typhus, and I didn't want to infect anyone. But I'll gladly infect you all. Esther straightened her posture clearly proud of herself. Then I sneezed on them, a big, wet, slobbery sneeze. I respected the courage it must have taken to do that, and the cleverness of having thought of it in the first place. No doubt that had ended the questioning. That's when they brought you in outside, 
She went quiet again, and I didn't think she'd say anything more. Then in a whisper, one of the Gestapo raised his gun, and I closed my eyes for what was coming. I knew it was coming, and that it hurt, but maybe not as much as the pain I was already in. I know that's cowardly, Chaya, but it's how I felt. Nothing you're describing to me is cowardly. She sniffled, and then added, someone told me something in German. I couldn't understand it, but he hit me with his gun, and I realized he'd been ordered not to shoot. I sneezed again and again, until I could, could see them getting nervous. Finally, they ordered me to, tie, to be tied up outside while they figured out what to do next. I knew that I had to be patient out there and not fall asleep in the cold, and I knew that you'd come. I would have come sooner if I could have, but you did come. With her good hand, she squeezed mine, and then, and at least it's over. I kept hold of her hand to warm her frozen fingers. I offered what comfort I could. In the gentlest way possible, I said, It's not over, Esther. We still have to get to Warsaw. She must have forgotten that because her shoulder slumped and she shook her head. I don't want to go anymore. I can't. We stopped walking and I turned to her, wishing I could take her pain away. It's all right. You've done enough. I'll find a safe house for you in the next town, a place where you can stay until the war is over. Do you still have the package they wanted you, you to deliver? Give it to me and I'll get it there safely. She nodded, a single tear rolled down her cheek. Then she swallowed her emotions and looked up at me. I have to be the one to deliver it. I promised I would, and I'll keep that promise. Then I'll keep my promise too, I replied. I'll get us to Warsaw. Her eyes brightened a little. I'm glad you were the one chosen for this mission. I smiled back at her, surprised to hear my own answer. Me too. I'm glad it was me.